Great. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, Tony's been a wonderful friend, and uh, I'm very grateful to, uh, to be here and to uh, share this afternoon with all of you. Um, okay, I'm going to read a number of poems. Uh, here are some from my uh, book, Blasphemer. This is called, There's No Crying in Poetry. <laughs> There's no crying in poetry. There's no crying in poetry, says Coach Yukowski. <laughs> Barnacle gnarled, stomping on the ground behind third base. But the poetry pitcher is crying. The poetry catcher is sobbing. The poetry shortstop is bawling. The poetry center fielder is doubled over, weeping bitterly. Yukowski shakes his head. Jesus, how the hell did I wind up here? He yells, hey, there's no crying in fucking poetry, you hear me? But no one on the poetry team is listening. But in the beer garden across the street, bar poets looking up are waving gloves at the ball sailing toward them. They stretch their hands above their heads and call out, I got it! No, I got it! I said, I got it! And then they collide and lie like kinks in a tangled hose. The ball lands and takes a bad hop, hits the barmaid, smack on the lip. Don't you cry. Don't you dare, she hears Pikowski say. And though it really hurts, and though she really wants to, she doesn't. Um, now, um, as a uh, writer, uh, for anybody who has uh, published a book, you know that you have to get blurbs. And Tony was kind enough to blurb my, uh, my first book. It was uh, wonderful. I love the blurb as well. Um, and so uh, blurbs for a while were very generous and uh, flattering and uh, even effusive. Um, but recently I've noticed a trend in which the blurbs have gotten a little harder, a little edgier, not quite so nice. And so the epigraph of this poem is, the old blurb is predictable in its praise and universally ignored. So this is the new blurb. One. This book touches your heart, but not in a good way. Two. Every day I thank God that books like this are hard to find. Three. To give you a sense of how infectious this book is, after I read it, I felt sick. Four. These aren't real blurbs. <laughs> There's nothing to be said about this book that hasn't already been said about some other book. Five. This is just the kind of book I never read, and you should too. Six. This book does the work of imagination for you, and that it's hard to imagine how it could be any worse. Number seven. If I truly understood all that's in this book, I would go mad, and I don't have the insurance coverage for that. <laughs> Number eight, I found this book being not hard to write, very easy to ignore. Number nine, don't let the fact that the writing in this book is terrible dissuade you from buying it. Support independent presses. <laughs> Number ten, this book proves the truth of the falsehood. Anyone can be a writer. Okay, um, so uh, the poems in this book tend to be a little blasphemous in terms of their ideas, their language, their structure, their form, uh, the way they're laid out on the page. Uh, so this one is called, um, and, and irreligious and uh, in general, uh, generally offensive. Um, so uh, this poem is called, Jesus is Zombie. Jesus was a zombie, I asked, shocked. My uncle turns toward me with a look of red surprise on his face. Absolutely! He was the king of the zombies. He was one of the first to die and then come back. So he's among the original undead. Sly, very crafty zombie, let me tell you. Gets people to eat his body and drink his blood. And when they do, they belong to him forever. He not only eats their brains, but he also devours their hearts. And then they can never die. Watch out for this Jesus fella, I tell you. He's after you, and he'll never stop chasing you down. What will I do if I see him? I ask, shaking in my chair. Cross your fingers like this. That'll make him think you're one of them, and then he'll let you be. What lies are you telling my boy? My dad shouts, running up from the basement. He grabs Uncle Ned by the shirt, jerks him up, and starts to choke him. Hey, hey, take it easy, brother. Just teaching the kid to fear the Lord. <laughs> so uh, this one takes a uh, reverent look at death. It's called Antigone Detente. 
I'm that age, I guess. People keep asking me what I want for my funeral. Give a shit. Let the dogs lick my bones, throw my ashes out the window. If I die in autumn, write the orange leaves over my arms. Sure, put my clavicle on your mantle. Feel free to laminate my lungs. Toss my heart off the dock. Use me if you run out of dark molasses or caulk. Make origami or a caftan or wicker furniture or a reku pot of me. Pan my hide, give me the rabid macaques. Dissolve me in nitric acid, water the garden of my face. Give Achilles free reign to drag me through the mud. Don't feel guilty, it's okay. I triumph, absolve you. So they asked his wife and daughters and sons what they wanted for their father. And they said, bury the best. Serves him right for being lit. Um, now, poetry is about a lot of things, but I've noticed that it's pretty much about one thing. Uh, and so my poem uh, is called, Poetry is Other People. Um, and if you've read No Exit by Jean-Paul Sartre, remember that the last line of that play is, hell is other people. So you can work out the logic. Poetry is other people. Is there nothing out there but misery? Tales of human fading, nomenclatures of the fallen body. Even if we forbade the saddest subjects, the tornadoes would still be there, the typhoon, the mudslide, the angry snow squall, the red volcano, the bridge collapsing, the window crashing onto the sidewalk, the flames leaping from roof to roof, from car to car, from tree to tree, insolent and snickering would still be there. The poems that are not destruction, what are they but decay? Did you read the one about the depression of the poet's brother? The one about the believing of the poet's daughter? The one about the alcoholism of the poet's mother? The one about the leukemia of the poet's father? The one about the dementia of the poet's grandmother? The one about the divorce of the poet's sister? The one about the autism of the poet's nephew? The one about the drowning of the poet's uncle? The one about the diabetes of the poet's aunt? The one about the disappearance of the poet's neighbor? The one about the incarceration of the poet's friend? The one about the suicide of the poet? We live where it's light, and right where it's dark. Thrill at the thundercloud, shun the sunshine. Pine for midnight, worship the ontology of catastrophe. The poet says, somebody's done. The poet says, you must change your life. The poet says, my mind is not right. The poet says, I weep like a child in the past. The poet says, I must lie down where all the ladders start. The poet says, if I stepped out of my body, I would pray. Um, and this one is uh, called, Flaubert Eats Breakfast with His Mom. And it has a line in it from uh, one of Flaubert's letters, uh, which I recommend very, very highly. They were sitting at the breakfast table waiting for more toast when she looked up at him and said, your mania for sentences has dried up your heart. That's not true, Mother. Louise did that in the out in the middle class. You're just upset. My fruit bowl is empty. Come, my darling, let's take a walk in the garden and water the desert of my heart. The future may surprise us yet. Gustav, my son, my star, you're incorrigible. Yes, Mother, I am. But give me your arm. The eggs will have to wait. Look. The sun is bleeding on the flowers. The clouds, soft guardians of virtue, they will protect us. God is out walking his dog, while over us, white bees hover like angels of clotted milk. So that's the last theme. So uh, let me turn from that to uh, our new book called The Vig of Love. The Vig being a loan shark term for the interest, uh, weekly interest that's, uh, that's charged you. Um, so this poem is called, A Debt No Honest Man Can Pay. I'm sitting here listening to Nebraska, and it's breaking my heart, not because it's plaintive and brilliant, but because it's taking me back to 1982. And our baby, not even two pounds, in intensive care in New York Hospital, far away, we live in Queens. It's what we can afford, but we see her every day, what one of us does, via the subway where I sit listening to Nebraska. And Springsteen is singing about paying a debt no honest man can pay. And I'm thinking, what is that debt? It's marriage, right? It's love, right? It's the privilege of having a kid, right? Not in the song, but in life. 
in someone's life, in my life. It's a debt, a brutally honest debt, but you never pay it back. No one can. Not with money, not with time, not with compassion, not with care, not with what I make, not even with what you make. I'm not talking hospital bills. I'm talking whatever, forever, can never be repaid. So listen, you listen to a song whose line hits you in your kidney and you double over as if you're pregnant, a pregnant woman. Not close, not close enough to term, but you birthed something anyway. And one day it becomes your heart. And then your heart gets pregnant and it gives birth to your future which you learn is made entirely of your past. A past where you're listening to a song, a concept, a whole album, again and again, over and over, the album, Nebraska, which never gets dull, never gets tired, never gets old. Um, uh, and let me uh, read a couple others from, uh, from this book. Uh, this one is called Libby, Lottie, and Carlotta. Libby tried divination, no answer. Lottie turned to numerology, big zero. Carlotta was interested in philately, but she found that sticky. Stay away from miracles, Libby. Do not tattoo the future, Lottie. What doesn't kill you will make you cocky, Carlotta. Biology is destiny to this extent. Our bodies lead us places we otherwise wouldn't go. Darkness is a long arc. No one escapes the entry into dirty sex, but you control the ugliness of the encounter. Pain is never love. I don't care what others say. It hurts my heart to read your poems. You deserve a night. Christ, commensurate with your beauty. Someone halfway decent. Listen, there's a place where parents don't drink, where uncles don't rape where brothers don't die. Where is it? All I know is it's not on the floodplain. And I'm going to read the poem that uh, Angela and her cohorts were so kind as to accept at uh, Rhino. And this is called Cranshaw on a Boat on a Boat. Cranshaw on a Boat. I have a series of Cranshaw poems. You'll have a sense of what this character is like in a second. We're floating on the chain of lakes, eating Rice Krispies out of a bucket. The sun is a soft lozenge, medicating a bright red sky. Water skiers hold on to their slackening ropes like love itself. On Party Island, the icy drunks that seize control. Cranshaw has his hand inside Margaret. No one is shocked. He was born brazen. But when he starts it on the Jews, Arnie gets mad and pushes him over the side. We let him tread water, then swing around to pick him up. Justice? Regret? No. Margaret wants him back. And uh, I'll read one more from uh, The Vic of Love. This is called Poem for Danny. Sometimes you're camping in Wisconsin, thinking about Melvin, and wondering what he'd make of Nat King Cole. And sometimes you're on a job in Idaho, and you hear the pop of cooking soup, but there's nothing in the microwave. And sometimes you're in Lubbock, in a hotel filled with polished apples and parts of recovered luggage. And sometimes you're in Boca Raton, in the company of salesmen whose wives died of complications. And sometimes you're in Park City, harried as a larian, lonely as a Cody. And sometimes you're in Park Slope, staring from a convention window at girders so innocent they seem almost metallic. And sometimes, floating in the Gulf of Mexico, you close your eyes and let the water cover them. And then for a time, which seems like mercy, you don't know where you are, or remember where you were, or dream of where you may go. Okay, so that's the big of love. Um, I know a number of you in uh, 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 Professor Barnstone's uh, class um, read uh, some poems in uh, pointed sentences, and I wanted to read a few of these. I, you know, what happens uh, in, uh, in readings is um, you have multiple books, you tend to just read from the latest ones, and even if you like the earlier ones, I don't know, Tony, you ever read any poems from him? Sure, probably. Occasion, just, just occasion, usually it's the uh, most recent work. So this gives me an opportunity to read a couple from uh, uh, pointed sentences. Um, in Tony's class this morning, we talked about uh, metaphor. So this is a poem. Uh, and. Uh, so I met Tony at that uh, American Literature Association conference a long time ago, maybe 2002. And there was a reading that night 
Um, and uh, we were all literary people, but a lot of them had, uh, you know, uh, uh, desires to be writers. And so it was a poetry reading that night. And I read, Tony read, and, and this is the uh, poem that I read that night. And that Tony, uh, I think this is when we became friends, he said, hey, you know, I really like that poem. So uh, uh, I think that was the beginning. Anyway, it's called The Grave of Rambeau, as in the French poet Arthur Rambeau. I visited the grave of Rambeau. It was pale blue, like the blood of a baby penguin. Upon its headstones were designs, beautiful and mysterious, like the brainwaves of deer. I touched the grave and found it redemptive, like the law forbidding adultery. I thought I was alone, but I was in the midst of a vast crowd, hissing like poisonous snakes on fire. I'd imagine the grave of Rambeau standing out from its field like a single candle in a cake. The grave itself was small, attic, quiet as a king at the end of his reign. Around the grave, the grass was burned, gray and stiff, like the lips of lovers who no longer kiss. I sat by the grave and felt at home, like bigotry in the hearts of men of God. Then darkness settled over the grave, sentimentally, like a kitten on the neck of a man. I left the grave and returned to Marseille, aligned like a knife in Adam's apple. Uh, okay. Um, and this is a poem called Bats in the Catacomb. It begins innocently in the third person, but ends defeated in the first. The sun improbably begins to thunder. The hills impossibly begin to rain. Black dew appears on the lintels of the pauper's doors. Garter snakes form an alphabet, decipherable only by birds. From the wind we learn there's a knotted form of everything. Across the world nothing is aligned, not suffering, not loneliness, not jobs. Dreams of being a millionaire are replaced by dreams of being a billionaire. That is to say, breakfast is no longer being served. Talk is so cheapened, the primeval language of desire stays shapeless. And uh, this poem is called The Lost Boys. They live in Colorado and Washington State, Alabama and the Carolinas. They squeak by on sad inheritances and pristine discards. Every day hurts. Just a little, but not enough. So dreams billow in and smother ideas. Meanwhile, the body does its daily dance alone. It's a neutral life, frighteningly fun. One fills one's lungs with schadenfreude. Two finds the missile hidden in the boot. Tomorrow will be incandescent, but if it isn't, who will remember to regret? Day bleeds into day and eventually clots into a life. Remember what Eminem taught. Let your longing be your GPS. Um, a few more minutes, or? I want to read some recent poems. That's good class. Uh, what do I have? <laughs> OK. We all saw it coming. We all saw it coming. The snakes in ascendance the dark satanic milling around, the troops of the nouveau greedy, the safety nets on fire, the cesspool of superiority flooding the brazen stage. We all saw it coming. The Pete Moss racists, the neonatal Nazis, King Lear, Queen Get Rude, the bully trident planted, the ratcheting down of sense. We all saw it coming. The tide of crude insurgents, Complacency swept away, virtue's camel toe exposed, the nipple slip of decency, the fondling of the tit turpitude, the gangbang of the plebiscite. We all saw it coming. I don't mean we. I don't mean we all saw it coming. I mean I. I saw it coming and did nothing. I'm going to conclude with this one, which is called Ways of Seeing Karachi. I become interested in Karachi, Ludovico Karachi, Bolognese, contemporary of Shakespeare, early Baroque artist, cousin of Agostino and Annabale, 
1612 painting, Body of St. Sebastian, thrown into the Cloaca Maxima, is a masterpiece of the frozen moment. Sebastian is limp in a sheet, supported by muscular soldiers. His hands hang down, his eyes are shut. Is he asleep? More likely unconscious. After all, he's about to be thrown into the great sewer of Rome. Unless one rotates the image, then he becomes beautifully vertical. His dreaming body, like a sleeping bird, floating in warm, soft air. Then, the closed fists and flexed forearms of the executioners are seen impotently attempting to hold him down. But nothing human can prevent his rise. Thank you very much.